Bwana Yesu asifiwe. Ah you guys. Bwana Yesu asifiwe. See, it is miraculous we are gathered here. Literally <laughs> for some of us. <laughs> Quite literally miraculous. Um so let me remove this. My name is Dina. Mrs. Otieno. I used to be here last year. I think um, I am blessed to have two sons uh, that are with me, not here. They're with their father, but they're with us. Uh, my oldest is turning six in August, and my youngest just turned four. And he's almost as tall as here. So uh, pray for us with shoes, budgets for buying shoes and trousers because the Lord is faithful to provide. Yes? <laughs> he clothes the lilies. He will clothe my very tall children. <sighs> Let me start by saying, Kwa moyo wangu wote Nasema asante kwako Masia Na shukuru kwa moyo wangu wote nasema asante kwako ewe masia na shukuru I say that because when we left last year, Akimi, I don't cry on stage. I'll shake it off. When we left last year, I didn't think I was coming back for four years. So to stand here looks like a dream, an absolute dream. And literally, you know, let me jump. I'll come back. You know, God hears those little things you are afraid to say. Ruthie told me it's just a lack of faith. Those small ones, you're like, Ay, this is too much for God, or it's too little for God, or I'm asking for too much. I just wanted to be home, just to hug my mom and see my sister and see all you people. You guys don't know. I'm seeing your faces. It's like a dream. And I'm so blessed. Philly is back, and these people I saw last year, it's so cool. That's why I'm singing that song. I'm also singing that song because I almost didn't come. We had a medical emergency for me, and I had to have surgery, and I almost didn't come. I almost didn't come ever. <laughs> but look at what God can do. See what the Lord has done. OK. Jesus, we are thankful that you gather us around your word. We are thankful that you have not left us to our own devices to figure out life on our own. You are a good father, a good shepherd, and we are loved by you. And I thank you that you have gathered us today around your word. Thank you for Carissa and Ruthie and Kelsey who have, and Josh, who have spoken so well at the beginning. And I pray, Lord, now as we look into your word, that your spirit will continue to minister and that, Lord, our lives would truly be refreshed in your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, go to John 6 and stay there. We're going to dwell there for a while. You're there? It is after Luke and before Acts. I'm helping people out. Even me, I didn't know where John was when I was starting in my Christian work. Okay, it's okay if you don't know. So the theme is all my springs are in you. All my springs are in you. I think in song. So if I start breaking out in song, just, you know, work with me. Um, and I added a little tagline, to whom shall we go? Okay, to whom shall we go? So, one. 
So that tagline comes from John 6 verse 68, but we'll get there later. So what Peter was answering is a question uh, by Jesus. Jesus asked the disciples in verse 67 if they would also go away because so many other disciples had left because of something controversial that Jesus had said. And Peter responded with words that have, have rung in my head since I was 19. I'm not 19 anymore. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, Peter is... Peter, bless him, he always says the right thing, but also says the wrong thing. But this time he was saying very much a right thing, that we have no alternative. He's standing there when a bunch of people have walked away because Jesus has offended them. They're like, this guy is crazy, we won't deal with him, we'll walk away. So context, I won't read the whole thing, because that's 71 verses if you've turned there, so we're not reading the whole thing. Um... But let me just tell you what's happening before we get to where we are starting from. At the beginning, Jesus has fed 5,000 men the previous day. And of course, these people have been impressed because with just five loaves and two fish, 5,000 men, and we're not counting the women and children, so we can estimate around 15,000 people at least have been fed by Jesus. And what do they say? They recognized him as the promised Messiah. Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 15 verse 18, um, Moses was talking about how to qualify a prophet. And um, I won't read it, but it says that the Lord answered and said, you have said rightly, I will send a prophet and he will speak my words. That he was talking about Jesus. And these people are like, here's the guy, because they were fed, not because Jesus said they probably didn't remember what Jesus said, but they were full and they're like, ah, this is the guy. So the men said in verse 14, now we are in chapter 6, verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Verse 15, therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. These guys wanted a political messiah. They were tired of the Roman oppression. They were tired of these guys making them walk one mile. You remember that? Jesus telling them, if they make you walk one mile, walk two. And they're like, what's up with you? Because the Romans were mean. They were cruel. Uh, they were colonizers. They were oppressors. And these guys were like, this is the guy that's going to deliver us. And they wanted him to establish his kingdom right there, and deliver them completely. But one, it was the wrong time, and two, they wanted a wrong king. They wanted a political messiah. They wanted freedom from Roman oppression. Jesus was coming to bring them freedom from the oppression of sin, which is a deeper oppression. Jesus was dealing with the spirit first. Then he will come and make the rule and reign permanent. All right, There will be a kingdom where we will rule with him and everything will be perfect. But right then, he was dealing with the root of the issue, which is sin. That's what he came to conquer. But they wanted a political king. So the day goes on. Um, disciples leave, and Jesus you know, takes a walk on the sea, as he does sometimes, because he's Jesus, and we are not. Don't try this at home. Um, Peter showed us what happens. <laughs> and the next morning, the crowd realizes Jesus is gone. And so they're like, ah. This guy who gave us bread, where has he gone? Follow them. So he followed him. And they go to the side, and that's where we're going to start in verse 22. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered this, the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone alone, However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people, therefore, saw that Jesus was not there nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Now, listen how Jesus answers. I just love him. 
He goes, Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled to their face. No chills. Like he's, <laughs> he's not even trying to be diplomatic. But you know that's the most loving thing that can ever be done. When someone tells you the truth. Proverbs, I think it's 27, says wounds from a friend, Kelsey. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, right? Jesus tells them the truth because he loves them. He's not going to banter about, oh, you know, I walked on the water. So what were you saying? No, he's going right for the jugular. Because he's come to deal with what? Sin. And he's not playing with it. He loves them and he will destroy sin literally with his body for their sake. So he's telling them the truth right from the start. Um, and he continues. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Now, he's setting them up for what we're going to teach at the end. So just let's follow. And these people hearing that, because Jesus sounds so spiritual now, they want to overcorrect. You know them, they were like, bread. And then he told them, by the way, what you want is bread. Then they're like, no, we are spiritual. They're overcorrecting. So, so they ask a question, trying to be spiritual. Uh, what shall we do hmm, that we may work the works of God? Now, you see, they, they, they still want bread. That's their problem. <laughs> they want bread, but now they're going to go at it in a spiritual angle. Like, Jesus, look at us. We are trying to be righteous. Please tell us. And he said to them, this is the work of God. One. Then they asked for works. Probably they were going to be told, now go kill a condo. Condo is sheep. Uh, kill a goat. Slaughter a chicken. He's like, no. No, no, no. There's no list of rules. The work of God, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. Please hold that note. Just hold there. We will come back and circle that a little bit. So then, them being human beings like us, they say, therefore, they still want bread, these people. Therefore, they say to him, what sign will you perform that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. These guys and bread. Now, me, I like bread, okay? I enjoy bread. But... Um, I get why they are slow, because if you're hungry, you want the thing you want. You will use whichever angle to, want, to get what you want. They're not getting where Jesus is going, but Jesus is so patient. He'll get them to the point. The point is not the belly. What is the point? We'll see. So Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. And he continues. For the bread of God is he, not it. It is not a thing that we digest and then go look for some more. The bread of God is a person Come, who comes down from heaven and gives life, not just temporary satisfaction and nutrition, life to this world. Then they say to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Did you hear? What did he say? The bread is a person who is coming from heaven to give life to the world. Then they are adding the word always, which means they are still thinking of the belly. I want to eat this food all the time. Dude is trying to talk to the spirit that this flesh of ours aish, is a struggle. But the Lord is gracious. Abounding in love. In fact, he introduced himself as the Lord, the Lord, long-suffering. Long, he, he, he's very patient with us. And Jesus said to them, I, now he's like, okay, let's now, let's, now let's get to the point. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. I am. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. 
all the father gives me will come to me and no one who comes to me no and the one who comes to me will by no means be cast out for i have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me and this is the will of the father who sent me that of all he has given me i should lose nothing but should raise it up at the last day and this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life and i will raise him up at the last day he has dropped the mic on them then the jews started to mama they like ai this guy what's he saying jesus is telling them he is the bread of life why they are murmuring is because they can't they don't they don't understand this is the guy that some of them saw growing up they went to the temple with him they saw him disturb his mother to have to go back and look for him they know he makes very good furniture they've heard he does all these teachings but what is he calling himself the bread of life what is that they are murmuring these jews who wanted him to be king yesterday are murmuring against him They murmured because he said verse 41 we're rushing through but I'll get to the points clearly I am the bread which come which came down from heaven and the Jews said is this is this is not this Jesus the son of Joseph of course they're wrong he's the adopted son of Joseph or something the son of Joseph whose father and mother we know how is it then that he says I have come down from heaven Jesus therefore answered and said to them do not mama among yourselves no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and i will raise him up at the last day and it is written in the prophets and they shall be taught by god therefore everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me now i'll skip a little bit verse 47 Most assuredly I say to you he who he who believes in me has everlasting life once again he says I am the bread of life So um I think I'll just have to finish reading it so I can continue talking Verse 49 Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread. How many times has he said that now? We are on the third count, I think, maybe four. Which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, and I shall give for the life of the world. Now the Jews stopped murmuring, they started quarreling. Now they're really annoyed. because what Jesus has said the bread i shall give is my flesh that's offensive to the jews they're not cannibals like what's this guy talking about so the jews call and say how can this man give us his flesh to eat they're offended but does jesus back off and say oh no let me explain uh, i'm not trying to offend you i just you know i love you so much no he pushes the point because he's dealing with the root cause like we said he's going after sin and he needs to shed light in that darkness Jesus said to them most assuredly i say to you unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood you have no life you have no life in you whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and i will raise him up at the last day for my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and i in him as the living father sent me i live and i live because of the father so he who feeds on me will live because of me this is the bread which came down from heaven not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead he who eats this bread which is Christ himself will live forever these things he said in a synagogue as he taught in capernaum therefore many of his disciples when they heard this said this is a hard saying who can understand it when jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured about it he said to them does this offend you 
Jesus has no chills. Like he's just coming for you. He's not, he's not beating about the bush. He's coming for it. What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and would betray him. And he said, therefore, I, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And then we come to that tag I've put there. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. That was a long reading. <laughs> but there's a lot of gems in there that I will not get to because I want to focus on Jesus being the bread of life and what that means and how it applies to us. We have talked about springs, satisfaction, refreshing. So I'm kind of bringing the carbohydrate to the conversation. <laughs> the bread of life. But it's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. So the Jews are shocked that Jesus has the audacity to call himself the living bread. And they are offended because someone has offered them his flesh to eat. What is he saying? When he tells them, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood, you have no life. He's not telling them to cut him up and, and, and eat him, obviously. That's not what he's saying. But what is he saying? Is it a reference to communion? No, it's not. It was, but found out it actually is not. Because communion was given to believers as a means of remembering the sacrifice on the cross. He is talking to people who be, do not believe in him. He even told them, you see me, but you don't believe in me. So he's initiating a relationship. He's not continuing a remembrance. Because if you read 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 to 26, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, Take it, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance. So communion is given for remembrance of the Lord for believers. What Jesus is talking about here is not communion. He is talking to unbelievers, people who see him but don't believe in him, and he's giving us the key to eternal life. He's saying, if you want eternal life, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. What does that mean? Let me first show you how the metaphor builds. In verse 27, he says, but food which endures to everlasting life, which like seek the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. Then he comes and calls that food the true bread of heaven. And we said the bread of God is a person, not a meal. Then he gets even clearer. I am the bread of life. Then even goes clear, I am the living bread which came from heaven and the bread that I'm giving is this body. You see the way he's so patient to make things clear. He's not left them to figure things out. Then he says, now this bread, unless you eat this flesh and drink this blood, you have no life. And when you do eat it and drink it, you will have life forever. He begins from food because Jesus is so kind to teach us with things we understand. That culture was bread. In this culture, it would be ugali of life or waru or mchele whatever, that put the analogy as you like it. The issue is to draw a picture of food so that as food is nourishing to the body, this bread of life is not only nourishing, but life-giving to the spirit, okay? And there's only one source of that life food for the spirit, and he's saying is himself. He makes it clear that he is the bread and that he will give us eternal life through his flesh and blood. His atoning, torturous crucifixion and death for our sin. He took our place, bore our sin, 
and his body and blood are literally given on the cross, literally, not figuratively. The Lord did not disappear from the cross as the Muslims say. I'm not going to start apologetics, but I'm just saying. He really did die on a cross, a really bad death, and really was buried in a tomb. And then he really, really did rise from the dead from that tomb. So then what does that mean? How do we appropriate his flesh and his blood so that we have eternal life? What, was, what must we do if we want eternal life? John 3.16, for God, good job, clap for yourselves. <laughs> That wasn't good. Clap for yourselves. Thank you. I've just remembered my children. That's the first verse I teach them. Now, also, in John 6.20, it says, this is the work of God. Remember, it was one. One job. To do what? John chapter 6, verse 20. One job we have. One work. To believe in him who the Father sent. That's all. Period. No extras, no additions. Consider this. It's a, it's a quote by Spurgeon that sort of helps us understand that it is believing. It is not doing. It is receiving what he has already done and believing that what he has done is enough. There's no extras. There's no ands, ifs, and buts. It's all of faith. Just believe that what he's done is final and it has accomplished the purpose of your redemption and is the source of your eternal life. Spurgeon says, and I'll read this slowly, in eating and drinking, consider when you're sitting down for a meal, are you producing anything? The food is already on the plate. The water is already in the cup. Are you producing anything? You're just going to pick it and put it in your mouth, right? So in eating and drinking, man is not a producer but a consumer. He doesn't do anything or give anything. He simply takes. So whether it is a queen or it is a poor person, all we are doing is receiving. So eating, because Jesus is saying, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Eating is an act of receiving in every case. And so it is with faith unto eternal life. You don't do, you don't feel, you don't do extras, you simply receive by faith what Christ has already accomplished. Okay? That's what he's saying. So to eat his fresh and flesh, excuse me, I'm from the mountain, to eat his flesh and drink his blood is to simply believe in Jesus and receive him fully. There is no other way, there is no other truth, and there is no life apart from Christ Jesus. And to receive him and put all our trust in him, all our hope in him, is the only way we have eternal life. Is the only way we come alive on the inside. Because like Ruthie was saying and Carissa was saying, everything else will not satisfy. Only Christ can. But the crowd is offended. He's explaining that, but the crowd is mad because they're saying it's a hard saying. I used to think that they didn't understand. But Jesus was in a culture that used metaphors. They knew what he was saying. They didn't like what he was saying. The Greek translation. Here we go with the Greek. <laughs> the Greek translation for that part that says hard saying is an offensive, intolerable word. It means I don't like what you're saying and I don't want to hear it. It's not like what you were saying was wrong. He just, they didn't want to hear it. So Jesus was not saying something confusing. He was saying something they didn't want to hear. But he presses through their offense to continue to tell them the truth because he loves them. They were caught up in this physical plane as we often are. We are caught up in the cares of the world. We are caught up in looking for material wealth. They were stuck on bread the whole time. And he's trying to say, I'm trying to give you eternal life. Not bread for every day. Eternal life. I'm trying to rescue you from sin. I'm trying to get you out of darkness into light. But they are stuck on bread. As we often are. All of us have been stuck on the physical 
and forgotten that God is about the physical. Yes, he'll provide, but it's more than that. There is a dimension, the spiritual dimension is where life really is. This is passing away. This body of mine, thank God, is passing away. And one day I'll be given a new glorious body and live eternally with him. This world is passing away. Pastor Josh said it's all going to burn anyway. And it's true. All of it is going to go away. So why put our treasures here? Why put our focus here? Why hang on things that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, will be gone? Why not put your treasures in heaven? Why not get eternal life? So Jesus is trying to tell them that, but they're not, they're not hearing him yet. So they walked away. And the truth is offensive in the world we live in. Because they had the truth and didn't like it. And I think all of us have been in that position where we hear the truth and we don't like it. We like autonomy. We like freedom. We like to live our own truth. We like to be the boss ladies of our empires where no one will have rule over us. Chasing after our own dreams because deep down our value is not in who Christ says we are, is in what we say we are or other people say we are. The things we've accumulated, which are passing away, ladies. They are passing away. Even my children, as much as I love them, I can't place my identity as a mom. They won't be here forever. I won't be a mom forever. But who, do you know who I'll be forever? His bride. That's who I'll be forever, and that's what matters. So if you live from that lens, then all these things are handled inappropriate. They don't become little idols. That I'm a mom, I'm a wife, and so others are not. Therefore, aren't we all going to heaven? Kwani what? Mothers will go to heaven first. No. It is if you believe in Christ. It is not these things. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. So... Christ is saying that he's the only way to God. He's the only source of eternal life. We live in a world that will tell you there are options. On this one, there's no option. There's none. It is Christ or nothing. It is Christ or death. Those are your options. He places options before you and says, choose you this day. There is no other way. And I'm telling you, if you're not born again, the world is very convincing. There is Buddhism, there is, uh, you know, whatever, agnosticism. We don't really know. No, no, we, we really do. It's right here. It's right here. It's historically accurate. It's, it's empirically provable. That's a big word to say that there is evidence that Christ existed. He is who he says he is, and he's coming again for his church. There is no other option. Don't let the world lie to you that you have options, not on this one. You have options for makeup and clothes, and you can choose a husband within the realm of the believers. Hello? Born again. Don't go outside. But on this matter, on matters of eternity, you have no choice other than Christ if you want to live. If you want to live, this is your choice. There are four questions. I'll do a little apologetics and run away because my husband convinced me to do it. There are four questions <laughs> that uh, philosophers say are the primary questions about life. Four questions. The first question is origin. Where do we come from? Where, we come from? Where do we come from? Where do human beings come from? The second question is meaning. What gives life meaning? Those are big questions. All right. The third question is morality. How do I distinguish good and evil? Okay. And then there is destiny. Where do I go when I die? Because we all die, right? Now, there are very many different worldviews that will try to answer that question. Some will say you just go in the ground and that's it. But is that true? All this experience and all this love you've had on earth just disappears and becomes dust. Does that make sense? I don't think so. Some people say we never really know what happens. But God has been talking to us since Genesis telling us what will happen. 
The thing about a worldview, and all of us have one, is that it informs how we view life. It answers those four questions. Where do I come from? Therefore, who am I? Where we come from answers, our origin gives us identity, okay? Where do I come from? Therefore, who am I? It gives us meaning. It answers the question of what is good and bad and where are we going? Every philosophy is trying to answer this question. When you are testing a philosophy, small apologetic class and then I'll leave it alone. When you're trying to test a philosophy on those four questions, they have to be coherent. Coherent means they have to make sense. The answers have to flow down in a sensible way. They have to make sense for you mentally and they have to make sense for you emotionally as well. Now, I won't go into all the worldviews that exist, but I am standing here to tell you without any fear that the only philosophy and worldview or religion that can coherently answer these questions is Christianity. There is no other. Let's look at it. The Bible tells us where we came from. Genesis 1. God created man in his own image. He's answered the question. That's where you came from. You didn't come from a comet hitting the earth. You didn't come from aliens transplanting. I don't, you know, there are very many theories. You did not come from a soupy thing and turn into a frog and then turn into an, a bird and then a, a monkey and then a person. No, you didn't. Even biologically, it's impossible, okay? The Bible gives us our origin. The Bible also gives us our destiny. Where are we going? Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed for men to die once and after this judgment. So Christ was offered for the sins of the world. So when we die, 2 Corinthians 5.10, we will appear before his judgment seat and everyone will receive the things he has done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So all of us, regardless of whether we are born again or not, will ultimately stand before God. That's the, where he sends you is up to him but you will stand before him. That's our destiny. What about the meaning of life? Micah 6, 8, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord who made you, remember where we came from? What does the Lord require of you but to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? That's it. Simple things. The meaning of life is not found by sitting with your legs crossed and meditating into your belly button. No. The meaning of life is found in scripture. God has given it to us. And he has clearly distinguished evil from good in Exodus 20. I won't read all of it. The Ten Commandments. So in answering life questions, these four critical life questions, Christianity is set apart, infinitely apart from any other worldview. And you go test it for yourself. Go check any worldview and see what can answer these questions as coherently and as, as intellectually accurately and even emotionally sound as Christianity does. There is no other. So, it not only answers the main life questions, but it answers the problems that arise from those questions. So, for, for instance, I understand what is good and bad, but I can't help but do what is bad. It hasn't left us alone. Solution, one work. Believe in Jesus, you will receive the power from the Holy Spirit and will be continually sanctified. Isn't that scripture? He told you where you came from, where you're going, what your life is about, what is good and bad. Then you say, I know what's bad, but I don't know how, to, I can't help it. He says, believe in me, receive the Holy Spirit and I will give you power to overcome darkness. You see how God sorts us out from beginning to the end. We are the ones, anyway, I'll get there. So... Another question you could say, I understand where we go after we die, but I'm afraid of actually dying. That's a legit problem, right? People are afraid of actual, the actual process of death. But the solution, trust in Jesus, his lordship over your life, and he will carry you through the process of death. And then where is the destiny? Where are we going? We're going to meet him and stand before him. Finally. So he sorted us out and all the questions in, in between. But when we see these claims of Christianity, why do we still struggle to trust him? 
Let me start with the unbeliever. Do you struggle to trust the Lord because you'd rather live on your own terms? You want to be your own boss. I'm not saying this from a vacuum. That's where we all come from. Before we are born again, the Bible calls us enemies of God. We are at war with him because we don't want to be ruled by him. But what will you gain by being your own boss? Christ is the only one who offers you true love and true life. What you'll get here is momentary spurts of excitement, probably worldly success and the praise of man. But remember where we are all going. We all have to give an account. So how does it profit you to be a boss lady here, but when you stand before God, you have nothing to offer? Everything else is a cheap imitation. Anything else that we seek is a cheap imitation that only leads to death and destruction. I've told you your options are two, Jesus or death. That's just the fact. There's only one way to eternal life, and that is through repenting of your sins and trusting completely in Jesus. That's it. If you're the unbeliever who's thinking, I have options, like I said, you really don't. You really don't. If you want to leave, you really don't have an option. And I'm urging you to resist the doubt in your head that makes you also probably think, I, won't, I can't handle this Christianity. I will fail. Because that's a legitimate fear. What if I come to Christ and I disappoint him? What if I come to Christ and I can't stay pure? What if I come to Christ and sin is too strong for me? The Lord is greater than all your sin. All your sin. Of every one of us here. Because he took it on his body and vanquished it. And the spirit is able to give you power to live a righteous life. Now you don't turn into a, a I don't know, an apostle <laughs> in one second. But God is so faithful to continually help you to grow. So if your problem is you're afraid you will fail, you come and see if he'll let you fail. You come to him and see if he'll let you fall. You come to him and see if he'll tell you, manage your own life. He's never told me that in all my years. He's never told Ruthie that she's been born again longer than I've been alive. And he has held her, and he's held all of us. So if you're afraid that you will fail Jesus, you come and fall on him and let him sort you out. Let him carry you. But if yours is a rebellion, you want to live on your own terms, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm pleading with you, you don't have a choice. There is one way to life, and that's Jesus. You have no other option. And I urge you to consider your life, not on the flimsy, fun things that you're doing for the day, but consider your destiny. Consider where you're going. Consider your spirit. And I pray the Holy Spirit will continue to convict you because I, I, um, you must be born again. There is no other way. Now let, let me come to the Christian and I'm almost done. Let's talk. Christians, hi. If you're born again, Babe, I'm going to, I mean, lift your hand. <laughs> okay. So, sorry. <laughs> Are you offended by Jesus? Has God disappointed you? Don't answer. Just, yeah. Don't tell your neighbor. It's just me. Just look at me. As, as guys are talking, forget everyone. Have you found, gotten to a place where God has, has hurt your feelings or he's disappointed you or he's denied you something that you think is a good thing or he's taken from you something that was beautiful. Are you angry? Are you sad? Are you disappointed? Are you asking where he is? What is he doing? What is he doing to me? Are you like Job? 
he's, he's saying he, he, he will not curse him, but he doesn't know what he's doing. God, what are you doing to me? If this is how you treat your friends, then you hold your tongue. You don't want to say, I don't want to be your friend. We are talking Christians. We are talking Christian women. You prayed, you begged, you cried, you quoted scripture at God and the thing failed. It wasn't a bad thing. You wanted a baby. You wanted to be married. You wanted your sons and your children to be born again. You are asking for things that are good, that God says are good in his word, but it's not coming. Are you offended? Are you hurt? Praise God if you're not. But some of us have been there. We've got to a place we look at God, we're like, you. I will not say what I am thinking. <laughs> I will drink water. My girls know that's my thing. If you're going to say something bad, put water in your mouth. Don't say it. Has God done something that has confused you? You're like, hey, Bana. What, what are we doing here? Why are you hurting me like this? I'm letting you think about why you're offended, then I'll come back there. Think about all the ways that you've asked God for something and he has held it back from you and you don't understand why. Now, what are the thoughts that come when you're offended like that? Maybe God is too busy for me. Maybe God doesn't really care about me. He has, you know, he has the whole world in his hands and we're too many. We don't have time. Maybe God doesn't love me. Maybe I'm not righteous enough. What's wrong with me? It turns on you now. And then, and then that cadaver called depression comes there and dwells with you and says, in fact, you are right. In fact, you are very right. You are so worthless, even God won't come rescue you. Have you has anyone, don't lift your hand. Has anyone ever heard the devil in their head like that? Have you thought, maybe if I just work more, maybe if I just serve more, maybe if I just do more, the Lord will see me. Because the devil has told you, he doesn't see you. You're, what kind, you're not a big deal. Look at you. You forgot to read your Bible on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. You are here. Praise the Lord. Condemnation. The lie of the enemy jumps on us, especially when our hearts are broken. Especially when we are confused. Especially when we are wounded. Please not by God. We live in a fallen world. Christ says suffering must come. Must. <laughs> you must suffer. Why? The world is fallen. That's why I told you, where are we going? We're going home. This isn't it. And along here, we will be harassed and we will be hurt and we'll feel pain because the world is fallen. But it's not God has not forsaken us. God has not abandoned. God has not forgotten. God ha does not not care. It's impossible for him. Look it. Look at it. Christian women, unbelievers think what I'm saying. Christian women, he sent his son to be whipped, his skin ripped open from the back, to be hung naked. Do you know the embarrassment of being naked? Naked on a cross, the Lord of glory, his son, for you. Do you think, do you think that he has forgotten you, surely? whose names are on the palms of his hands. Can he forget you? Can he abandon you? The enemy will tell you he will. He's told me. I'm telling my business. He's told me enough times. You're standing there, you're worshiping the Lord. Look at you. Eh? All these things have not worked out. You've been unemployed for 12 years. What value do you have in the world? Can't even buy your mother a packet of sugar. The Africans know what I'm saying. Do you know what I'm saying? When you show up to your mother empty-handed and you feel like a piece of wasted space. Is it true though? Am I worthless? 
But are you? If you say I'm not, why do you think you are? You who the Lord of glory came from heaven, comes down to earth, lives among this filth, dies a, a, a criminal's death for your sake. You think he can forget you? I am taking too much time. What I am saying, Christian women, listen to this song. I will not be moved and I'll say of the Lord you are my shield, my strength, my portion, deliverer, my shelter, strong tower, my very present help in time of need. That's who God is. Don't let the enemy lie to you. Ladies, Christians, women of God. Don't listen to the lie. You hold on to this scripture. If you have to read one word five times because you're not understanding it. You pray, even if all you can pray is Jesus, Jesus, Je that's all you've got. You pray. You don't let him lie to you. Don't let him take your life. Don't let him take your joy. Don't let him render you useless in the kingdom because of a lie. We will suffer. That's the truth. I won't lie to you. This world is bad. But where are we going? We're going home. Now don't give up before we get home. Ruthie said, they go through the valley of Baca and they, and they put wells, they dig wells, and the people that come after them in that bad valley benefit from the wells. Do you know there are women looking, they're coming after you. They're watching you suffer well and it will encourage them. You suffer well. How do you suffer well? You hold on to this. You hold on to fellowship. You don't leave the fellowship. Don't walk away. Don't let the enemy leave you on the side so he can attack you. To say those women did not remember my pain, I won't join them in fellowship. Ah, he's got you now. Now he's got you. he would be like, hey, little girl, you have brought yourself. And he will hit your head until you start losing your mind. Don't let him do it to you. Christian women, you pray, you sing, you read the word, you stay in fellowship. Don't be discouraged. Don't be moved. If you can't walk, kneel. Stay there. If you can't get up, lay on the floor, you stay there. You don't move. Don't quit on God. Because he has never and will never quit on you. Never. Now you hold on. You hold on with everything you have. Do you hear me? Are you hearing me? I have said you hold on with every ounce of energy you have. If it's this much, if it's the size of my tiny nail which I bite sometimes, you hold on with that. Because what? His power is made perfect in our weakness. His power is made perfect in what? Our weakness. You think he can leave you. It's a lie. It is a lie. Don't believe it. Don't believe him. And if you feel the darkness is too big, that's why he gave us a body. Okay? We are, I'm not one body of Christ. I'm probably a toenail. But there's another nail next to me and I can see, hey, life is hard. And together, us two toenails can pray. Where two or more agree. Where, who is there? The Lord. And us two tiny toenails are going to stand together and we're going to pray our little toenail prayers. And the Lord is going to come through for us. Don't quit. Please don't. Don't be discouraged out of fellowship. Don't be discouraged out of reading your Bible. Don't be discouraged out of attending church. Don't be discouraged from serving. Your heart broken. I have been on this stage with my heart shattered. But this is where God meets me. So I will not be moved. Not because I have strength, but because where else can I go? Who else can I go to? Who else? Who has a words of eternal life? Buddha. Buddha is some, I don't even know who he is. Forget him. Who else has eternal life? Allah. Allah is a demon. Leave it alone. Who else has it? No one. No one but Jesus. So I will stay there. Nitakufia hapo. Means I'll die there. Nitakufia hapo. 
Why? Hata nikikufia hapo naenda kwake. I go to him. Don't let the enemy take your testimony and let those other ones coming after you be discouraged because you quit. Don't do it. I'm seeing gray hair and I love seeing gray hair because these are women that have held on. Now you older women, I know you don't talk about your problems to us small girls. But if you see us in a corner, because the Lord has given you riches of wisdom and longevity that we don't have yet, you come, you just hold, your, hold my hand. And tell me one testimony. I've been sitting with Ruthie this week. And she's telling me testimony after testimony. I'm sorry I'm over time. She's been telling me testimony after testimony of how God has provided. I watch her with her husband and I think God is great because I didn't grow up there. And I look at Kelsey and I think, look at you. You should look at your mother more because I'm just staring at her. I'm like, see what the Lord has done. I look at Ushi. Ushi is... Is my, is my kid's Oma. And she has been so kind in the gentlest way. Oh, she is not braggadocious, showing up. She's not an extrovert. But her faith is steady, consistent, steadfast. And she's been through some things, which is not my business to tell. So when I see all you gray hairs, please stay in the church. Please come to our little fellowships. Please tell us how God has been good. Those of us going through childbearing and we're like, these people, they don't listen to us. You tell us, ah, don't worry. Even mine didn't listen to me, but God is good. When we go through struggles in our marriages, you tell us, ah, those, those are, don't worry, God will come through. When our faith is being shaken, we barely can hold on. Yours is stronger. It's been around for a while. You come, just hold our hand. Just hold our hand. And tell us, the Lord who has kept me 40 years, I don't know how many years for Ushi, I'm sure it's a lot. And all you older ladies, the Lord who has kept just seeing you here is enough of a witness that God is faithful to keep. And the stories that are in your hearts are stories that need to be told. Because the next generation needs to hear the wondrous works of God that he did in your time. And they will tell the next generation, yours and theirs. And then the next generation, then we get strong. Because we know whom we have believed. And we know that he is faithful to keep you, older ladies, so he'll keep us. And I'm saying these older ladies because they look like my moms. But all of us are older to someone. You stand firm for the sake of Christ in his strength and those coming after you. And God will bless you for that. Please don't quit. I said hold on. Hold on. With your little strength, you hold on to him. God can never fail. He has never failed. Look at this older women. I almost want to make you stand up, but it's inappropriate. This is evidence that God does not fail. This is evidence that God does not fail. And you know what? So am I. And so is every one of you that is here. Evidence that God is unable, incapable, can never fail. God bless you.